Good morning, good morning, good morning. We'll give, a, or good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever wherever you are, whatever time zone you're coming from, the future, the past, the present. I will just stall a little bit while we admit people for a few minutes. Did a little soft shoe. Is everybody wearing pants, pajamas, evening wear? Prefer not to say, it's complicated. Take a loud sip of my drink as we wait for people to come in actually dressed. Good for you, Natalie. I have pants on, very cozy. iPhones coming in, people coming in. So weird to think of this as coming in right into this void. I'm trapped in your computer as we all are, or perhaps your tablet, are you on a phone? If you're driving, pull over or keep your eyes on the road. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to pant pressure you into Emily. Pants, scarves, toques, blizzards, sunscreen, depending on where you're coming from, perhaps doesn't look like anyone's sitting outside. Maybe you are. Thank you. This is the Golden Girls living room. It's my digital home. I'm so used to it now. I, I, I've tried other backgrounds or real backgrounds and it just doesn't give me the same comfort. Pajamas, good. Walking home from groceries. Okay, well, Eye on the sidewalk. All right, enough chit chat. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. Hello everyone and welcome to the sixth sleep salon of the research creation project, the sociability of sleep. My name is Dana McLeod and I am a sociability of sleep artist in residence. I'm excited and delighted to be with you today for the second sleep salon in 2022. This session will be recorded, so please feel free to have your cameras off. When we post this video to the website, we'll make sure it has captions. The Sociability of Sleep Project is physically located in Chochage, otherwise known as Montreal, and is situated on the traditional and unceded territory of the Kanyagahaga. We recognize with gratitude that they are the traditional custodians of the lands and waters on which we meet, live, and rest. Chochage has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among many First Nations, including the Kanyagahaga of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Huron-Wendat, Abunaki, and Anishinaabeg peoples. I'd also like to share an acknowledgement developed by the Feminist Media Studio at Concordia University for our pandemic forms of assembly. Well, Zoom, a company that has exploded in value during the pandemic, is the technical custodian of the platform on which we gather today. This makes us no less occupants of the multiple territories on which we are all physically located. Zoom's headquarters are located on Muwekma Olone territory. The Olone have historically understood about sustainability, communal societies, giving gifts to those who pass by, and sharing space. Their horizontal organization might inspire different emergent models of peer to peer networking in the pandemic that we're enacting here on Zoom. We see Zoom as a platform which connects us and which alienates us from the aims of restitution, justice, and reparation. The Sociability of Sleep is supported by funding from the Government of Canada's New Frontiers in Research Fund. On the Sociability of Sleep website, you can sign up for the newsletter to find out more about upcoming events such as future sleep salons, workshops, and a call for artist residencies. Please reach out if you're interested in learning more or collaborating with the Sociability of Sleep. So today, thank you so much for being here. During the salon, please feel free to use the chat uh, to share your thoughts, comments, and relevant links 
that our discussion brings up for you today. There'll be a Q&A after our presenters, and we'll be taking a speakers list in the chat and inviting you to unmute your mics at that time to ask your questions and offer your comments. Uh, you can also post them in the chat if you prefer that I read them out. Today's conversation will take place in English. However, please feel free to ask any of your questions or make comments in French as we are happy to translate. But first, before we get to Q&A and the discussion, I'll introduce our first set of presenters who will speak for about 20 to 25 minutes. I'll then introduce our second presenter who will also speak for about 20 to 25 minutes. And then we'll open up the floor to questions and discussions. Yeah? Ellen Sebastian Chang's theater work spans 45 years as a lighting designer, director, arts educator, and producer. She began her professional work at age 19 with the Berkeley Stage Company as a light technician, developed her craft as technical director lighting designer with the Blake Street Hawkeyes, developed her writing directorial style in the early 80s with devised site-specific works, including the seminal debut work, Your Place is No Longer With Us, which was published by West Coast Plays and won a Bay Area Critics Circle Award for New Directions in Theater. Ellen's creative work has gone on to receive numerous local and national awards and grants. She is co-founder, co-artistic director of Life on the Water, and has collaborated as producer and director extensively throughout her career, including a 12-year association with Conjure artist Amira Tabur Smith and Deep Waters Dance Theater. She is currently serving as resident owner board member for East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, advisor for Esther's Orbit Room Project, Artist Housing. Uh, Amara Tabor, Tabor Smith is an Oakland, California based choreographer, performance maker, and the artist director of Deep Waters Dance Theater. She describes her dance and performance work as conjure art. Her, inter her interdisciplinary, site-specific, and community-responsive performance works utilize Ryoba Lokumi spiritual technologies to address issues of social and environmental justice, race, gender identity, and belonging. Her work is rooted in Black queer feminist principles that insist on liberation, joy, and well-being. She is a 2021 inaugural recipient of the Raynan Fellowship, a 2019 Dance USA Fellow, 2018 United States Artist Fellow, and a 2016 recipient of the Creative Capital Grant with longtime collaborator Ellen Sebastian Chang. Amara is an artist in residence at Stanford University. Welcome, Ellen and Amara. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to you both. Uh, we've tested out the share screen, right? So that's all going to go fantastically. Uh, we look forward to, to engaging with you in the discussion. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Thank you for those gener that, the generous introduction. Um, hey, Ellen. <laughs> Here we are. Okay. Uh, and uh, I also wanted to really acknowledge... Uh, Dana, your, your really profound acknowledgement in the relationship of connecting this virtual world of Zoom to, uh, you know, a lonely practice and using that as a way to get us to presently think about how we can, uh, we don't have to completely resist these technologies, but understand how to transform these trans. Uh, these technologies in indigenous thought, spirituality. Um, so uh, that was really incredible. Thank yeah. you for that. I, 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 I learned a lot in that moment. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. So are we just talking here? What's happening? You're going to lead us in with a question. <laughs> what, what, what are we doing here? Sleeping? What you want us to just dive in about uh, Black women dreaming? Yeah, that would be great. Um, and okay. and just in I'll paste in the link for to to uh, more about the this Zoom acknowledgement that I spoke about. But it'd be really great Thank to hear you. about your practice. And I know you have some really engaging images to show us as well that represent some of the work that you've done. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. great, great. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll start sharing. Um, maybe what we can, you know, start with is the project, just give an overview of the project where um, the inspiration for resting 
came from uh, the Black Women Dreaming episode. So Ellen and I um, embarked on a project in 2015 called House Full of Black Women that addresses the um, displacement, well-being, and sex trafficking of Black women and girls in Oakland. And we started that project in collaboration with a group of artists, activists, sex trafficking abolitionists, um, Black women who mo by and large live in Oakland or lived in Oakland. Um, and we started by gathering around a table monthly to um, look at how we wanted to address these issues. And at one of our gatherings, we always started with a check-in. And in fact, our gatherings at the table were largely just check-ins that became the fertile soil for our episodes. Um, our project happens as a series of episodes in public spaces throughout Oakland. And in this one, uh, gathering, everybody started out by s talking about how exhausted they were, how exhausted we, we were and are. And I started out jokingly saying, oh, well, you know, I think in our next episode, we should just sleep. <laughs> and we laughed. And then it hit me, no, really, that's what we need to do. Um, and so uh, we basically embarked on uh, uh, developing a, an episode that was uh, predicated on our rest. Um, Ellen, do you want to talk? And I will pull up the screen and share some images related. Uh, so with this uh, and this idea that uh, came to the table, Black Women Dreaming, uh, a ritual of, of rest uh, began in uh, 20, the idea began in 2016, and the first iteration of it was in 2017 with an organization called Chapter 510, the Department of Make Believe, which is a writing uh, salon for, for youth. Uh, one of the things that, that we discussed a lot is that we, at first, we thought about doing it in Chapter 510, which is a big open public space on Telegraph Avenue. But after much consideration and thought, we said, no, the actual rest, ritual of rest should be private. It should not be something where, where we are being observed by the public. So through that process, uh, we, we came up with a series of public rituals that first image was um the the beginning of the public ritual of the blessing what we call the blessing of the beds where the women who had signed up to come and sleep nap rest in this um, private home in west oakland were given the public opportunity to come yes to bring pillows blankets we had healers there um and we all gathered and we blessed their blankets we blessed their pillows so that they could be sent off to have sweet dreams um and we did a series of public workshops um, one was with a sleep hygienist and it was located at regina's door regina evans is the uh abolitionist sex trafficking abolitionist that we worked with and we so we had a workshop to talk about sleep hygiene with uh, groups of Black women. We did a series of writing workshops. Um, one of the members did a series of writing workshops with Chapter 510 with uh, uh, teenage girls and also elementary school girls around dreaming and creating dream poetry and uh, also uh, dream essays that were then publicly performed. Uh, we created at Chapter 510 a gallery installation. Um, one idea was to create uh, with 
Shelley Davis Roberts, who's uh, an architect and also dancer with Houseful and a designer. We design uh, these rooms, this hallway made of clouds. This is a room that is um, light sealed where Alexa Burrell, our uh, sound designer and videographer, created these very dreamlike videos and people could uh, bring in a pillow there, they could rest in there, they could sit in rocking chairs and just look at this uh, dream videos, these light clouds. And one of the other designers, Yoshi Asai, created this uh, almost like a nest, you know, a dream nest. And if you go up to uh, the little signpost, there's a button there that just, you know, you push the button and, and fog comes into the room and just scatters the imagery. So it's very peaceful, you know, very low level sound. So we wanted to create spaces that were very peaceful for the public to engage with, knowing that someplace um, where it was unknown, there was black women actually being cared for, resting and dreaming. And all the women of Houseful were the attendants for that. We took care of these black women. They were told, leave your phones at the door, take your shoes off. We will wake you up if you're just here for a nap. We will provide you tea, caring. Um, and, and can I add into that, please. that, um, in our process, it was really important that we practiced, you know, sort of practice what we preach is that every every woman who attended had to sign up for a period of rest and be attended to. So you could not, you know, the members of House Full of Black Women could not uh, be attendants if they did not um, have their time of rest because we also wanted to disrupt our own culture of being the caretakers who don't get taken care of. Well, and that that was in our second iteration. Both. That was in both. Yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of second iteration. And, and then, then um, we worked with the Ashara Ekundaya Gallery to do uh, the next iteration, which was in uh, 2019. And it was called Divine the Darkness. And we created, uh, again, another, as you can see, it's much larger scale here, ritual of blessing of the beds. We created two different rooms. Um, one, yes. room, this is from chapter 510. Yeah. But we sorry. created uh, two different. Oops. No, that's fine. This is okay. also from chapter 510. So this is 2017. Uh, the, the ritual of rest. And that's fine. Uh, yeah, I think. Oh, there. yeah. Okay. This is from uh, Divine the Darkness. And uh, again, Shelley Davis Roberts, along with Alexa Burrell, and then the lighting designer, Stephanie Johnson, came in and worked. Uh, they created uh, a divination. And it was beautiful because the divination, uh, this pendulum made out of copper, was uh, filled with uh, white grits. Yeah. And so you would shake the pendulum and the pendulum would have grits spiraling onto a uh, floor mat where overhead projections of video was happening and as as a form of visual divination and this room was totally totally dark also within this room uh near the end of of this week long of rest gina breedlove who is a sound healer came in and we actually did a grieving ritual at the end of of the the process as a way for the, the the women to to collectively and privately this was only for black women only for black women it was not uh, videotaped it was j just contained within here with a few photographs and people grieved and and Gina did a, a healing along and with that can I um, add to that the the reason that we uh, felt the necessity for the grieving ritual was 
um, based on our first experience with Black Women Dreaming in 2017, um, women who came to rest often would be sobbing, you know, uh, when they arrived and when they left, um, because it was, you know, it's a very emotional experience to be deprived of something and then be offered um, respite and offered, you know, support. Um, and so we really felt like, and, and also, you know, there were women who signed up who didn't show up and we felt like, you know, that made sense. You know, it's, it's a scary thing to actually, um, you know, allow ourselves sometimes to have the thing that we, we are deprived. It reminds us how painful that is. So we, so that, that ritual grieving was to, you know, give space for that so that we're not under the illusion that, oh, we should just feel good about it. And we're just going to be able to rest because some women, even in their um, time of resting, talked about how difficult it was, you know, some slept really well and some, you know, tossed and turned and, you know, it's all indicative of um, the, oppre the oppressive structures that we live under. So the, the grieving ritual felt really important to um, bring into in our second iteration. Um, Let's see. Yeah. Um, Ellen, do you want to talk about this oh, I, at all? No, go yeah. ahead. You're doing great. Okay. Oh, <laughs> um, so a uh, part of what we do, um, and, and actually I'll go back to this image. Um, so on the wall behind you see a, a rendering of Harriet Tubman. And I just want to, um, honor the fact that Harriet Tubman was one of our um, sort of spirit guides through this process. Um, as we talk about Harriet Tubman as, you know, the great abolitionist who led folks to freedom, so many people um, out of it, slavery into freedom, we don't often recognize that um, she had what is, you know, called narcolepsy. Um, but her dreaming life when she would fall asleep uh, during these passages would give her, she would have visions about where to go next. And um, that is something that's not often held up. And as, as an abolitionist who never uh never led a a uh, uh a trip towards freedom unsuccessfully that never happened and yet she fell asleep every time that we really felt the importance of recognizing the power of sleep that we're all denied that we all are you know in this culture are struggling with and so harriet tubman was um one of our spirit guides. Um, and then <clears throat> one of the rituals that we engage in um, is uh, we, we, we have processions uh, that are inspired by the Egungun masquerade um, that is found in West Africa in, in Nigeria, among the Yoruba, in Benin, and the Egungun masquerades are, um, they are ritual processions where you're invoking the ancestor spirits, either an individual or collective ancestor spirits, and this is uh forms a basis for a lot of the uh the ritual work that we do with house full of black women so for this closing of black women dreaming uh in 2019 we had a ritual procession um in honor of the spirit of rest and also in honor of harriet tubman oops and i think that's it with the photos Hmm. Yeah. Um, so 
he, what what else could we say? Um, I I don't know. I think I think this is a good place to to pause. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, if can I offer a a question um, mm -hmm. about your practice and about working together? Um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about how you know I, I know that you've been working together for many years how these projects evolved out of um, out of your relationship out of your collaboration out of your friendship uh, as well as extending to the communities that you are working with um, something else that I uh, sorry I just have so many questions um what what I also wanted to highlight um, ask about uh, something that I found really intriguing was this idea of private performance um, and and, and, and I guess in a negotiation with uh, an audience um, and this pressure uh, that as performers, as creators, that we're all under to represent a work. Um, and these private acts and private rituals that you're offering through this work are so meaningful. Um, and, and perhaps you could talk a little bit about uh, the, the reception from the participants as well. So, you know, just everything. Uh, um, um, so recap, yeah, so, so, so to recap, uh, you, you know, yeah. your collaboration, how you've come come together, uh, as well as um, these performative rituals for audience, but also for with and from some of your participants. Um, I'll start off by saying that in terms of our relationship, Ellen and I, go way back. <laughs> Ellen was uh, one of my teachers in high school and was, you know, has been a mentor for me. And, um, and we, uh, and then we ended up collaborating. But more importantly, it's been about a build, you know, a cultivating of a relationship over a, a long time. Um, and, uh yeah and 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 there was something else i was going to say but i lost my train of thought ellen you want to chime in um, to uh we we all uh know that relation relationships really are the foundation of everything they're the foundation of everything and we have no idea when we connect with any human being or <laughs> anything, where that's going to go. And so um, when we think of, 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 of a future, I'm just gonna be philosophical for a minute, is that uh, my grandmother used to always say to me, uh, be respectful, be loving, because your reputation will get there far before you do you you will be there before you know it and so the fact that um i amar and i met in high school and i was you know we're exactly 10 years apart in age there could have been no way that either one of us could have projected that we would be here in this moment right now and so it i it bears for a kind of thoughtfulness um in terms of the public and private, because I'm mindful of, of our 25 minutes, um, one of the things about any, any form of work is there's always a private element to it that the public never sees. Look at governments. Governments are constantly meeting privately behind doors, and then they come and present publicly to us what, what we're supposed to accept. So I don't see the work that we do as any different than what any um, group of elders or thinkers or anyone that, that does, that you meet, you work out all the messy stuff, all the messy stuff, you work it out, you do it, you rehearse it, you, you plan it, you think it through so that you can publicly present something that, um, that hopefully is the thing that is healing. Medicine. You, you do that in laboratories and then you mm -hmm. present it to the public. So, and, yeah. 
Yeah, and I, if I can just add um, in terms of how that translates with the communities that we work with is that we don't we we don't we don't see ourselves as separate from the community. You know, we are the community. Um, we're working with a community of people that we know, and then that <clears throat> that those relationships, you know cultivate and grow and expand. And then there are more people. When we started at the table, there were, I believe, maybe nine of us. And now at the table, there's 25. And that's just in terms of a core um, collective of, of uh, you know, uh, the, the, the core collective of House Full of Black Women. But, and within that, are our extended communities. So we really, um, we don't, we, we really do not approach the work as that, you know, we're coming into a community to offer something that we're not a part of. Um, that, that's not, um, that, that's not, that, that's not evoking the circle of connection that's a straight line as if i'm going to go do something with these people who are not me and we find that to be very problematic um so that's that's how the community uh works you know so it's not just people that we know but it's people we get to know through our association with the community we're in Here's another great example of what Amara is saying. Amara, uh, uh, when we, uh, I think it was like, mm, we've done like 14 episodes now. So I'm going to say this might have been our third episode where Amara had this idea of doing an all night song circle that started at sunset and ended at uh, sunrise. And it would be centered around Black women singing nonstop. And there was no flyers handed out. There was, it was all word of mouth. And it was so wild, this word of mouth, that I remember getting into an Uber, a group Uber, and there was two black women in there. And we just start chatting and then blah, 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 one thing. And then the next thing I know, I said, I said, oh, well, you know, there's, you know, I'm involved in, in household black, we're song server. And these two black women said, oh, we know about it. We're going, I had never seen these women in my life. I did not know who they were. And I had chills. I had chills. So we, we cannot forget the power of, of, connection that way that that we want to be connected okay my my timer just went off at 25 minutes so <laughs> i don't know if y'all are keeping time but i'm trying to be very respectful of yasmin so anyway and the audience okay so that's it well um, thank you so much let's continue this conversation um after after we hear from jasmine um thank you so much for sharing uh, your insights and again um, the discussion. Can't wait for the discussion. Uh, next, we excuse me. Next, we'll be hearing from Jasmine Fatheja, who is an artist in public service committed to ending violence against women, girls, and all persons. She builds ideas for public and collective action. Jasmine is a founder and facilitator of Bl Blank Noise a growing community of action sheroes, they rose heroes, citizens, and persons, taking the agency to end sexual and gender-based violence. Jasmine initiated Blank Noise as a student project in 2003 in response to the silence surrounding street harassment in India and globally. Over nearly two decades, she worked with communities and designed a wide range of interventions across forms of media to shift public consciousness and build ownership of this issue. Jasmine facilitates building testimonials of sexual violence, confronting fear narratives, victim blame, initiating healing, listening, and empathy. Jasmine's approach has grown from addressing street harassment to victim blaming, that which connects spaces of violence ranging from public to private. Jasmine's artistic practice rests on the power of collaborations and building feminist solidarities. Facilitating collective imagination and desire is at the core of her practice. She mobilizes towards the right to be defenseless through the I never asked for it mission and meet to sleep. 
In 2019, Jasmine received the prestigious Visible Award awarded for socially engaged art practice. She was also awarded the Jane Lombard Fellowship by the Vera List Center for Art and Politics at the New School in New York. BBC listed her as one of the 12 artists changing the world in 2019. In 2015, she received the International Award for Public Art for the project Talk to Me by Blank Noise. Jasmine is a TED Talk speaker and, a, and she is also a TED and Ashuka Fellow. Welcome, Jasmine. So, so nice to see you. I'll turn it over. Thank you, Dinah. And uh, thank you, Amara and Ellen, for that really, really powerful and beautiful uh, presentation and talk. Um, I, I was very, very inspired. Um, I have uh, a little bit written in, so I'm going to just read that out before I get to the slides. Uh, thank you again, Alana and, uh, and this panel for having me here. Um, the body in defense, the prepared body, is created in a climate of warnings. It gives in to the climate of warnings. It also runs the risk of being limited by what it, it, it directly resists. It runs the risk of transferring a memory of fear and threat. And this is a call to disrupt that cycle because our bodies and the generations to come deserve experiences rooted in defenselessness. We deserve a state of defenselessness, and this is an invitation to imagine that defenseless body, your defenseless body as your birthright. Meet to sleep. Um, I'll just open my slides one moment. Um, In 2005, um, we at Blank Noise had invited women, non-binary persons on the blog and on the streets of Bangalore to list out something they don't leave home without. What we gathered was turned into a project we called the Museum of Street Weapons of Defense. We wanted to draw attention to fear as a lived reality for women in their public spaces, in their public environments every day. Blank Noise was started as a graduation project in response to street harassment at a time when street harassment didn't really have a vocabulary. Um, it was seen as just teasing. It was seen, it was called Eve teasing and started as a graduation project. And uh, since two, between 2003 and now, uh, Blank Noise has worked uh, and mobilized a community of people who, that we call action sheroes, heroes, deros, people who are taking agency to end sexual and gender-based violence. And in the first decade of work, we were bringing attention to street harassment, naming it, identifying it, making making our experiences visible to ourselves, uh, examining fear, examining and speaking about um, experiences that we just had not named before. Um, and we questioned our silence, we questioned how we had internalized blame. And we, and so really for me, blank noise is kind of divided in two parts uh, where one half of the practice really rests on building testimonials of violence and the second half or the other half listens in to these testimonials and designs I, uh, ideas for collective action. These ideas are rooted in the bodies we deserve, the cities we deserve, the public spaces we deserve and the futures we deserve. Um, over time, uh, we as action sheroes, deros and heroes have learned to set new rules for public behavior. Um, back in 2005, 2006, we were learning to stand idle in public spaces. We were learning to see, uh, you know, what would happen to us. And, and you know, uh, when we learned to be idle and we were also learning to ask what would happen to a public environment if it witnessed so many women being idle instead of looking down and going home as fast as you can. Um, we also did these actions because we were um, relying a lot on web-based uh, mobilization. We were blog-based and through the blog, you know, in, in different cities and the press would pick it up and then the word would spread. So it's always been about 
creating these calls for action and inviting citizens and individuals to take it up um, and making it their own. Um, but with that is, an, is another kind, I mean, with that, there's a certain kind, of out, certain kind of outreach, but it also comes with its challenges of being able to gradually ask, you know, who is building this practice and who is not and why, and, and who's being left out because of access, because of language, because of uh, how the messaging is designed. Um, so while we were learning to stand in public spaces and be idle in public spaces, gradually also laugh in public spaces through these laughter clubs called the Ha 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 Sangha, which brought together an intergenerational group of women in neighborhoods to again move from, shift the relationship of fear to a place of belonging in our public spaces and through friendships and solidarity. Um, in all of this, I mean, all of that practice was leaning really towards creating space to imagine, to uh, protect our right to imagine, pr to protect the right to desire, uh, so that we're not limiting ourselves by just firefighting to end sexual and gender-based violence. So one of, one of the calls to action was called, I Wish, I Believe, where women on the blog in 2007 or 2006 sent in a list of wishes that they had for their city. And I was very, very struck by that. I was struck by how simple these wishes were. Uh, wishes like, I wish to be able to get wet in the rain and not worry about somebody staring at me. I wish to be able to wear that pair of earrings or I wish to be able to um, you know, uh, whistle while walking the streets. And I'm usually facilitating, but I took the leap into also uh, imagining for myself. And I really wished to be able to sleep. Um, the following year, um, some of us as action sheroes got together and went to Bangalore's Carbon Park. And we said, let's claim our actions. So there was action shero Saraswati who dared herself by sitting on a park bench and reading um, and having a snack and stretching. There was me who went equipped with a blanket, who went equipped with this cushion, and I tried to sleep. And this act of sleeping, even though I was in the presence of others, was extremely, was a negotiation. It was, it was scary. I remember, you know, reminding myself that I had my community around me. There were five, six of us, but I couldn't sleep. I almost would go to sleep and I would wake up and realize it's just leaves rustling. I would again almost go into sleep mode and I would wake up to realize it's just a dog passing by. And it's only in that moment that I became acutely aware of the fear that I was carrying on my fist, in my back. And in that moment, I just, you know, I had this thought around that there are more of us. It just made me think about the, the story of fear and how we had inherited fear. And I lay there just thinking of how there are so many of us in fear of each other than with the actual intention to harm. And um, can we look at trust? Can we look at defenselessness as the right? Um, and I just lay there imagining thousands of women, non-binary persons sleeping in public spaces. And again, questioned what would happen to a public space to witness this moment and what would happen to us and our bodies? The us, I cannot speak for all, but that is the inquiry. Who does this idea speak to and why? And how do you make it your own? And it was also at that moment where we were critical of who was building this collective and who was not. Um, and who were these ideas speaking to? So how, how does the, you know, how, how, how do you, so I guess the, you know, it really sort of, question, I started questioning, I started inquiring what solidarity meant and that really is at the heart of Meet to Sleep. So that's where it was seeded in 2007. And by 2014, I'll just take you through a few images before I get to what Meet to Sleep is. Maybe. Okay, I think this, um, I'm just trying to show the full screen actually, so. So Meet to Sleep is a collective action which invites women, non-binary persons anywhere actually 
to come and take a nap anywhere under the open sky. Earlier, our call to action was around um, sleep in public parks. And as the idea grew and built its outreach, uh, we relearned that in that many parts of the country where there are no parks. So the invitation changed to sleep anywhere under the open sky. Um, and that's, you know, so Meet to Sleep brings together uh, uh, women, non-binary persons to build this action together. Um, and it is, it is an act of, um, it's, it's kind of championed by different, um, I'm really sorry, I'll just stay with this for a moment. It's championed by, um, there are, the whole process is that different uh, leaders and different feminists, they champion the call to action. The idea really is, you know, the call to action is Khule Asman Tale, Under Open Skies, Azadi Ki Or, uh, Towards Freedom, Jaha Dar Bhaag Gaya, Where Fear Runs Away, Hum So Gaye, We Fall Asleep. <laughs> This is with Sadhavna Trust in Lucknow. This is Kamla Bhaseen and I'll play hers. We also build this on 16th of December. Every year we've been building this on the 16th of December, also in uh, memory of uh, Jyoti Singh, who was gang raped in 2012. And uh, it's a day that many um, that we mark as the day to do need to sleep in. And this is Kamla Basin. She also uh, she it's kind of relies on multiple feminist networks. And Kamla Basin, who uh, passed away last year, has uh, championed the call to action. And she has um, uh, yeah she's been at the at the heart of the feminist movement in India. Just. Play this. On 16th of December, with deepest of sadness, we will remember Jyoti Singh and every girl, boy, and woman who has been sexually harassed in public spaces. We'll go out into public spaces, lie in the sun, read, or sleep say goodbye to the fear inside. We will let the world know that India, its streets, its roads, its parks belong to us women also. We'll tell everyone that in 1947, freedom came not just for Bharat, but also for Bharatis. Will you uh, do the same and go and lie in a park tomorrow and feel free? I'll also play Hamida's video from Sadhbhavna Trust in Lucknow. It's, and I will do a bit of the translation. Hello, everyone. This is Eshwar. Adab, I am Hamida Sadhbhavna Trust. And this time, we have a different identity of women. This, this time we women across identities. Need to sleep ko apna bana rahi hai. We are making need to sleep our own. Ani, Pandra December ko ham sari ladke ikhatta ho rahe hain aur ek aise khule maidan mein, park mein, jahan par ham khul ke saas le sakte, jahan par ham bina dare apne need ko bhar sakte. Where we can sleep without fear, where we can sleep free from fear. तो इस तरह से हमें सुरक्षित माहौल बनाना है खासकर हम औरतों के लिए तो इस पूरे कैंपेन को हम आगे ले जाएंगे और इसी तरह से हम सारी लड़कियां मिलकर बिना शर्म के बिना झिझक के to be able to do this without any hesitation without any sense of shame that's you know that's why we're building need to sleep डर के और उस खुले आसमान में नील भरेंगे और साथ ही साथ धूप की गर्मी अपने जिस्म में उतारेंगे we will um, we will take you know we we want to soak in the sun and and build meat to sleep and get rid of the fears that we've been carrying inside to hame lagta hai ki is cheez ki shuruaat hamare liye bahut hi aham hai bahut hi pukhta hai aur jisse hum apni hazri daj kara payenge thank and hamida uh, also you know one way of looking at meat to sleep is that it could be a call to action and there are people building it but i'm also interested in how can this be 
a movement and how can this go beyond event making to movement building and that's where the heart of organizing meet to sleep really is um are, you know are these inquiries and and it is about building relationships it is about having the capacity to hold these many relationships and um and those are the messy things that we are dealing with as we think of who does this idea speak to and why and who builds this simultaneously as we build and i won't share all of these videos but hello as, everyone um, as we as we create meet to sleep we also at the end of every event there are you know there are toolkits and guidelines that go out to partners and allies who are making it their own uh, but at the end of the event we do form a circle we do um, gather and discuss we have conversations on how did you sleep uh, did you sleep on your back did you sleep sideways um, we also get into conversations on um, on you know the configurations of sleep in terms of did you feel like sleeping huddling or did you want to sleep separately and we have these guidelines around safety where we want to be in each other's line of vision um but also you know so so every i think what we make visible and clear is that this can be turned into any any form based on your comfort your discomfort and your willingness to you know to to give it that shape so the facilitation um, and the guidelines carry that kind of message around uh, making it your own. Uh, so that's the preparedness that we offer in the facilitation. We've also seen that Meet to Sleep has sparked other campaigns. Like, for example, when a group in Gujarat, Anandi, when they built Meet to Sleep in rural India, it led to a new campaign for them called Jagya Apni. And I'll just play that, which went into, which means, which went into more of citizen rights and women's place. In, in in the country. So I'll just quickly play this. It's in Gujarati. There are also those who write in saying that I'm trying to do this alone. I'd like to do this alone. So this is Action Shiro Paki, who did a meet to sleep in Bangalore's uh, Hebal area on her own. And she said, I was in the park from 1.15 to 3.30 p.m. And my heart was pounding as I entered. I picked up a spot and eased myself into lying down. And since I was absolutely alone, I took a book and two bananas as my decoy. I put a leaf between my between the pages and held the book real close to my body and shut my eyes. Every rustle felt like someone had walked up to me. The wind felt like it was blowing away my sheet and my shirt and my skin was showing and all the sounds around me were amplified. But my body just wouldn't let me fall into sleep. So I did the best I could for a re I shut my eye and shut my eyes for a really long for really long so that everyone who saw me thought I was asleep. When I woke up, a few men and women were, uh, were looking at me uh, off and on, but um, it didn't look like they cared anymore. Two boys were sitting close by on the grass, but it didn't seem to be bothering them either. So I clicked a few pictures and came home. It's also what happens to the place. What do people around it witness and the questions it raises for them? Very often we've been asked, what are you doing here? And there's a whole group of men lying there but the men are not asked. Um, so we claim a normalcy and we say, we're just sleeping. And, um, and, we, and that's where the surprise happens. The negotiations also sometimes begin. I remember a conversation with a security guard in the park who just insisted that it wasn't appropriate to do this. And it just turned into being a little street smart and saying, where in Bangalore have you seen such a beautiful tree? And he kind of went along with it and let us sleep. Um, this is Sakina Parveen, who is also in rural India, in Shorampur, who, um, if, if there is time, I'd like to play this also. Yeah, okay. Naam kya hai? My name is naam Sakina Parveen. My name is Sakina. Where are you from? I'm from Janipur, Muriya Chakma. And when you were sleeping here for two hours, what did you feel when you slept here for about two hours today? 
में कभी एक गांव से इतनी दूर फील्ड में कभी नहीं सोई हूँ पर आज ही मैं सोई हूँ इसके इससे मुझे लग रहा है जैसे आसमान में चिड़िया उड़ते हैं खुले जगह खुले आसमान में वैसा ही मुझे भी महसूस हो रहा था मैं अपने आप को आजादी महसूस कर रही थी I haven't ever come this far away from my village, and today I did, and I felt like a, uh, I felt like I claimed freedom, I experienced freedom, and I felt like a bird. So, like I said, after every session, we every meet to sleep, we have a gathering, and we we process uh, our experiences. And this is uh, Nia and Vijay, mother and daughter duo, who always who've been coming and building meet to sleep for the last many years. and one of the questions that nia her daughter raised was uh, you know around why so i'll again just read out what vichy shared when my 11 year old daughter was hearing the adults share she kept whispering back what is the big deal about sleeping in a park while she may be too young to understand this my hope is that with movements such as these she would continue to ask this question even as an adult woman living in india so we we work we wanted to be we wanted to be a normal a desired normal and um, here are just a few quotes around what fellow action heroes and uh, deros and heroes have shared uh, my mind was racing and i was hyper aware of my surroundings but tried to ground myself by being in the moment i focused on listening to the birds and the rustling of trees in the wind i, I eventually fell asleep but woke up when i heard people walking by it another thing that i wanted to highlight was around people and and it also speaks to what amara and ellen shared about care that very often we have action heroes deros returning to meet to sleep because they experienced it for themselves so uh, there's always a facilitator there's always uh, somebody who can't sleep in that moment and in the way it's organized so it is the past action heroes who show up to be present to to be another number uh and and to offer that feeling and that experience of safety to another uh so that that kind of labor is also what it rests on um and that kind of uh, the fact that strangers are creating a safe space for each other and strangers are creating a community and most of them are not known to each other unless it's a feminist ally and a, and a community of people who who already know each other and have are doing it somewhere else um so in i think over the last couple of months i've also been you know we've been receiving uh, a lot of documentation a lot of reflections from partners and allies who built me to sleep and we're trying to make meaning of between my storytelling and what is the shared experience of this and we still it's still a work in progress but as we've been listening to different interviews and and responses and reflections of uh, of partners and allies who built me to sleep i've been noting down words and vocabularies also with a group of people who uh, some students who i also worked with so we were transcribing and uh, listing down words and we said okay how do we how do we really how does it really speak of a collective experience and it really drew attention to vocabularies of desire and descent through meet to sleep so i've listed a few words that i think sums up what meet to sleep could be as a shared experience there was a there was somebody who used the word sukoon which means calm there was somebody in a, a, the one of the videos who said ghabrahat which means to feel nervous or anxious khauf which means fear khwaish which means desire anubhav which means experience jhijak hesitation dupatta a scarf many many of our partners allies and meet to sleep participants or fellow action heroes have spoken about feeling uncomfortable around the fact that we don't know uh, you know if our clothes are going up or if our bellies can be seen or this this discomfort with the body being visible uh, many need to sleep allies and uh, and also um um uh, fellow action heroes have spoken about how it's difficult to even sleep at home when there are men in sharing the same house and we're told that you know how to sleep um it's difficult sleep in the balcony so to to do this um is and to do it and to be able to do it together is what it rests on also 
um, sharir, the body. Be, be fikr, be fikr, without worry. Be baki peda, means giving birth to fearlessness. Tarika, methodology or a way of doing something. This is a recurring um, word, naya tarika, means a new methodology, which also links where art practice and community and, and catalysis, I suppose, comes in. Aram, which means rest. Shuruat, which means beginnings. Khulkar, with openness. Hum bhi, us too. Maza, fun. Ekta, solidarity. Dunia badal jayegi. The world will change. Hissa, my share, my claim. And with that, I'd like to just close it for now. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Jasmine. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Amira. Uh, let's get into some discussion. We have about 30 minutes for discussion. Uh, so we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. If you have a question, we'll take a speaker's list via the, the chat. So please just add your name there. And please try to keep your questions succinct so that we can get to as many people as possible. Um, you can also feel free to use the chat to continue the conversation. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll start us off. Uh, Y'all talked, uh, you've just given me so much to think about, um, but you've also, you've all talked about sleep, certainly as restful, but all of these barriers to sleep. Um, Jasmine, you were talking about, you know, hesitancy, grief, the anxiety of performing sleep in public, uh, as well as in, in private. Um, and you all talked about the sort of power of collectivity in sleeping. Um, I was quite struck, uh, uh, Ellen and Amira, with uh, some of the work that you showed that signaled or signified to perhaps a public that Black women were getting rest, that Black women were sleeping. Um, and you all also talked about the these um, ca the care that surrounds this work. Um, so so I, 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 I'm not sure that I have so much of a specific question, but just some of these these things that I'm noticing about um, these 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 points that you're making about you know building community, building solidarity, but also how special it was when say outsiders or people you didn't know to the the work were brought into the work. Um, I'm not I'm not sure if, it, if that's a if that's a good impetus if you if you want to add to or or jump in about um, things that surround performing vulnerability in public um, and this building of collectivity. Sorry, um, Dana, could you repeat the question? Please, sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, sorry, more succinctly, yes. Um, in, in a question is, can you talk about that vulnerability in building collectivity through sleep? Uh, <laughs> You know, that's that's where solidarity is seeded. That's where, uh, you know, that's where instead of the call to action becomes solidarity, not through being defensive and, and transferring fear, but in, um, in the willingness to support each other in their right to be vulnerable. And that's what brings everyone together and uh, sometimes gradually together. Um, uh, because somebody may may realize that only after experiencing it, uh, somebody may leave questioning why they couldn't sleep, but may not have found that answer yet. Somebody has even said, "What's the big deal? It's I just came and slept." <laughs> and so it it there's a spectrum of of responses, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I feel like having an answer to that is also constant work in progress. I'm still 
watching the videos. I mean, many NGOs are used to sending documentation, for instance, in a very uh, monitoring and evaluation lens of documentation for something. But to look at it as a collective storytelling is another way of approaching the purpose of what we're doing and why we're doing. So there, there are many, many stages of, of building meaning together. Yeah. And it's, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Um, I, first of all, I was just really moved, Jasmine, with, um, the work and the images and, you know, along the lines of, you know, on this sort of thinking about vulnerability, I, I really loved, uh, the, the phrase, you know, my right to live defense, defenseless, um, was just really summed up, um, just around this idea of vulnerability for us we one of the things the work has been around how do we cultivate experiences of mutual vulnerability understanding that um uh allowing ourselves to be vulnerable is a practice that um we are unpracticed in you know, from our own experience as Black women, we we are always feeling um, on the defense, even when we don't are not necessarily conscious of it. Um, I will say, in Black women dreaming, um, a personal experience that I had actually was uh, the second time that we did and i'm using this story as sort of a, a way to talk about that practice and um practicing vulnerability was that during our second um installation of black women dreaming um of there was a night when there was some uh there was some confusion around scheduling for those who were going to be in attendance in the in the secret resting house where black women came to rest and that night i had a scheduled night of my own rest as i said you know our practice was rooted in that you know we could not tend to others if we were not allowing ourselves to be tended to. Um, so there was a mix up with who, you know, uh, scheduling mix up and those who were supposed to tend to black women's rest uh, couldn't be there. And so I said, oh, I'll, you know, I'll fill in, I'll jump in because that's what I have to do. You know, I'm going to give up my night of rest. And some of the other black women in house full of black women said, no, we got this we're going to take care of it and i had a body resistance to it um where you know i uh i was you know my immediate response was no 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 i got it i got it i will do this and my what what came up for me was my own vulnerability around um that uh, I was actually so ready to give up my own night of rest um, was actually indicative of where I had trouble letting myself be attended to. And when they, you know, so it was, it was an intervention on me and I felt very vulnerable and I did not expect that. Um, but it was, you know, it reminded it was it was a good example around that this you know we talk about vulnerability as you know allowing ourselves to be vulnerable um is a lot harder you know in in practice than it is in theory um so it's this uh yeah i will just say it is it is a practice that we have to keep we are unpracticed in because it's not safe the world we live in is not safe especially for those who are you know women or feminine identified thank you thank you both um i think alana has a question if you want to open your mic i thank you all of you for that um amazing hour that we just spent with your work. Um, I have a question uh, about 
knowledge practices, actually. Um, Amara was really just thinking about what you were saying about making a practice of, of being vulnerable. And um, I also just want to acknowledge, I'm Alana, I'm one of the co-directors of the Sociability of Sleep. I just really want to acknowledge how much Jasmine's work um, was a huge inspiration for this project as a whole. This idea of the right to be vulnerable, the right to be defenseless, um, has stayed with me really powerfully since the first time that I encountered your work, Jasmine. So um, like this, <laughs> we're standing on your shoulders and <laughs> thinking through a lot of these questions. Um, and I wanted to ask a question about knowledge because when uh, Ellen and Amara were talking, I was really struck by how you mentioned that you worked with a sleep hygienist and um, uh, the notion of sleep hygiene uh, is really interesting and compelling, and yet I think it's often so inadequate to addressing uh, all the different ways in which sleep gets compromised by, uh, by different populations. And you also talked about how you were working with um, conjure culture, uh, ritual, uh, magic, these other forms of knowledge as well, these knowledge practices that are often seen as being kind of at odds with sort of more rational or scientific forms of knowledge. Um, and then I was really struck by the place of grief in that argument, grief as grieving for something that we often maybe didn't even realize was missing for us, which I think is something that Jasmine has developed a lot of practices to bring out in her work as well. I think she's really amazing at helping people recognize the habits that are so built into our bodies that we don't even know that they're there anymore. Um, so I just, I wanted to just ask you about how you think about bringing those different kinds of forms of knowledge together. What was it like working with a sleep hygienist? But then how did you, how did you come to draw on these other kinds of knowledge and practice? Because, you know, sleep is a, a paradox, right? We know, we all know how we slept. We know how we feel in our bodies. And yet um, we're often reliant on others to tell us about our own sleep to tell us, you know, was it good? Was it bad? Did you snore? Did you not snore? That kind of thing. So yeah, I just have a question about kind of knowledge practices. Okay, well, um, first, I, I have to acknowledge that uh, I am uh, very weepy after watching uh, Jasmine's presentation. So my voice is very shaky right now um, because I find myself being very conscious of, you know, how even the binary of first world and third world, I find myself being very conscious right now and self-conscious of notions of vulnerability and, 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 and privilege and so many things right now. So I, I just need to say that because my voice is very shaky right now. Um, when Amara first presented the, the ritual of rest, um, there was this moment of investigation. Uh, there was the simple moment of where Amara and I sat in front of her, as we jokingly called Google, Father Google, and, and said, oh, are there, what are images of Black women sleeping? And really, there was none. There was none. You know, uh, and so we have knowledge. We've always had knowledge. It's just how the knowledge gets erased and also how the knowledge that we've carried in our bodies for century has been devalued. And so it's also a practice of restoring the wisdom and values of the knowledge that uh, uh, various indigenous, uh, I like to call earth-based cultures have had all over the world of the value of sleep, the value of dreams and how uh, modernity, you know, and I'm not a Luddite, I'm not against modernity, but the concepts of modernity uh, not only devalue the, that knowledge, but also commodify it. So then sleep becomes a commodity. I'll use Ariana Huffington as an example that she wrote a book. I think it was in 2012. Um, I'm not quite sure, but quite a while, you know, a little bit before this about um, the power of sleep 
And not long after that, Ariana Huffington has a whole line of, of sheets and, you know, and, you know, towel, you know, everything, pillows, you know, and so, so what we're always navigating here is how, how what is very natural to us as as animals, as part of the animal kingdom, is sleep and rest. But in an industrialized world, uh, then it becomes something that needs to be, as you so succinctly put, investigated. It needs to be studied when sometimes we have the answers. In Oakland, in the Bay Area, for example, uh, the you know, there's so many uh, health organizations that have asked Black women, what do you need to be stable? Okay, what do you need to be stable? Housing, housing, housing. Oh, but we need to study this and study that because we're, we're not going to address the most simplest pathway, which is you cannot rest well <laughs> if you're housing insecure. You know, you can't, how can you rest well if you, if you're, if you're in a neighborhood that is, um, has so much violence, you're housing insecure, you could be evicted the next day, or, you know, you, you, there's 10 people sharing one house, you know, of two bedrooms and comings and goings. So there's so many systemic things that we have the knowledge to say, okay, change this. And it's, as Jasmine pointed out, it's like, uh, I, I want to be defenseless. I I didn't ask for this. I think that's a big takeaway. I did not ask for this. You know, I want something that I need is very simple: a comfortable place to to lay my head in a in a darkened space where uh, I don't have the fear that I will be attacked in my most vulnerable state, which is sleep which is sleep. And we know if we're not rested, we are not, we know that the health uh, crisis that we're in when we don't have rest, we, that, that, that's been proven. And under this sort of capitalist patriarchal system, like you go, how much proof do we have to give? There'll always be another study. There'll always be another book. Always, always, always. And so I feel like we're in this incredible loop that's so hard to just say, stop. Let's stop this loop. How much more do we need to study this and study this? So I'll just stop there. So thank you. Uh, Amara Jasmine, did you have a response to this idea of knowledge production that Alana was talking about? Not to put you on the spot, but I guess I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think what I'll say is really, uh, Ellen has really said, um, but is reminding us that um, the knowledge, as Ellen pointed out, is in our bodies. Um, and it's the it's not only the knowledge of rest, but it's also the knowledge of um, the the knowledge of what causes us to uh, be unrestful or uh, being unable to rest. Um, so, you know, when we when we invited the sleep hygienist, it was, you know, we also recognize, and I think Ellen pointed this out, is that, you know, the information that the sleep hygienist put before us around what is needed for rest, you know, there were so many aspects of what they presented that are not available to us, you know, like, oh, you, you know, you have to sleep in a certain kind of room, um, you know, have, you know, uh, quite, it, have quiet or, you know, just, just all of these, um, these things that were necessary for good sleep hygiene that are not available, you know, when we don't have the privilege of space of, uh, living in a quiet space, you know, so it was, um, so it's also, you know, in some ways that information was, um, 
um, that if information is also somewhat traumatic, you know, to experience when you are hearing what is needed for good rest that is not available to you. And so what was, you know, that, that was a, 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 was a very informative public offering. And at the heart of the work we do is rooted in ritual because ritual, you know, for me, the difference between ritual and routine is a routine is something you do every day um, to get it done. The ritual can be routine, but it's what you endow it with. It is, you know, it is the intention that is behind it that makes the difference. So um, ritualizing our rest, you know, was crucial to say, what are we trying to endow this with? You know, this ritual of rest was endowed with uh, the spirit of our right to rest so that, you know, how do we create the circumstances um, how do we draw on what we know we're deprived on, uh, deprived of, and endow this ritual with, you know, the anecdote to that? Um, and it's very simple, you know, um, yet seemingly so unavailable in our our culture. And so I think even along, you know, what Jasmine was, you know her offering it, that's a ritual that is that is an act of as ellen would say insistence not resistance but insistence on our right to rest and resting uh to be you know uh defenselessly you know um yeah i don't know if i really answered that question but i think um the thing about knowledge production i think becomes you know even you know, talking about the performance of rest, I see performance as work, you know, performance, you know, is like we perform this act of something as opposed to allowing ourselves to be insisting on the right to rest, not being a performance, but actually, uh, you know, a an act of letting ourselves be. Well said, well said, right? All the pitfalls of late stage capitalism. Let's be productive. Let's have a performance. Let's document everything. Let's mine it to make an app. Let, you know, and navigating all of these um, like sleep as commodity, you know, as you, you all been, been talking about. Um, I wonder if you have questions for each other. Um, this is just such a generative conversation. Uh, I, I'm not seeing any other conversations in the or excuse me, um, uh, questions in the chat. Uh, I, th I open it up to Jasmine, Amara, Ellen. I, I don't have a question, but just a lot of, I just have gratitude for, for the vocabularies, for the words, for insistence and resistance and ritual. And um, I just, yeah, I just have a lot of gratitude because I feel like I'm not responding, but I'm like, I'm, I think I'll be going away with a lot of thoughts and hopefully, you know, I'd love to, you know, find a way to keep this as something I can return to. And that's the feeling I'm, I'm with right now. So, yeah. Um, I, it, it is, it's, it's, um, it is so hard to untrain because it's almost like a training. We have been trained, uh, to navigate the world a certain way. We have been trained. And I think that, that, that is why yes means, uh, uh, images from, uh, you know, just the young girl saying to, what is the big deal about sleeping in a park is a reminder that when we first <laughs> enter this world, this material world uh, into these, you know, physical bodies through the, through the portals of our mother's bodies, um, we're absolutely naked, open and vulnerable. And we are uh, these, uh, I think, 
I imagine, or I like to believe these, these, these souls that have come through with a certain amount of inherited uh, embodied knowledge, uh, you know, genetic knowledge, but also, um, you know, a kind of curiosity, a kind of that, then that kind of curiosity, that simplicity of like, well, why can't I just lie down in the dirt <laughs> and close my eyes and let my belly show and let the leaves uh, blow over my body with no fear, feel the sun on my face. And these things are so um, radical because there's a, there's such a simple truth in them that I think sometimes when we return to the most simple truth of who we are as, as um, I like this word that Alexa Burrell, our videographer has shared with me over the past few years, she, she, she said during the pandemic, she said, she goes, I'm starting to realize we're all just critters. What kind of critter are we? And I love this word because of its playfulness that yes, we're all just critters in our little, you know, critterness, you know, that, that we, that sometimes we figure out how to create. And there's a playfulness to that and how, um, how dreams are such a gift and dreams, you know, uh, come to us at different stages of sleep, how, yes, how the science and knowledge is important in its relationship to um, Aboriginal dream time, you know, where I love Aboriginal dream time, where they, they, where there's this thought of, oh, you know, I can meet you in the dream world and we can solve problems there. We don't need to fight in the, the, the material world, you know, we could actually, um, you know, meet in this other plane that there's this other plane and maybe the scientific world does not believe that that is possible. So, but even in the scientific world, there is a mystery of going, well, why do we dream? Okay. And, and in the scientific world, I think that there's a, I think that's starting to, I hope some parts of it are loosening up that, that there is great mystery to to everything around us, such a great mystery. And that some of that mystery is looking into what we've called the void, you know, this, this darkness, you know, this darkness that, that our bodies seem to need to, to rest. Uh, and that we also know that in the, the technological world, um, uh, that part of torture for getting confessions, for getting all these things is to have lights on, to have lights on, to have loud music playing. And it's already been proven that if you don't sleep after a certain amount of time, you will die. Just like if you are deprived of water and air, you will die in food. If you are deprived of sleep, you will die. The body will wither and die. And so I think this question of sleep and breath and sustenance, sustenance of fresh water, fresh ideas, fresh medicine, fresh sleep, that sleep is to refresh us. It's like, how do we finally all collectively globally and i in my core believe that something is happening right now if we are not afraid and that is also what uh yasmin's work spoke so much of the women talking about being not afraid not afraid of the most simple things and that is where i think it's a moment for us to ask ourselves are we willing to be courageous? How willing are we to be courageous? Courageous to say, I need a nap. And that become, you know, there's the work of the nap ministry, you know, that is so 
that started just around the same, started at the same time that we started um, Black Women Dreaming. And so that kind of collective unconsciousness that we go, oh, we're doing this thing, but if we're doing it and we're feeling it, trust, there's millions of people around the globe. They're feeling it too. So, so I'm very hopeful in my, um, in my emotions right now. I'm very hopeful. So thank you. Thank you. What a great place to, to end. Thank you so much, Amara, Ellen, and Jasmine. Uh, and thank you all for, for joining us today um, and taking the time to, to be with us. Uh, the next Sleep Salon is February 25th at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on sound and sleep. There's also a workshop coming up on Friday with Jenny Lynn. Uh, Friday, Thursday, Friday, Thursday. Sorry, I'm getting mixed information. Alana, any? The, sorry, I'm looking at my calendar. 11, no, 11, Friday. The Friday, the 11th, 2 sorry. to 4 p.m. Sorry, just doing a little check-in. Um, called Dream Scenes, a Dream Comic and Zine Workshop. Uh, more information on these events on the Sociability of Sleep website, as well as just pasted in the chat. Uh, a reminder to you that this talk will be available on the YouTubes for your future study. Thank you all so much again. Um, this has just been so generative and wishing everyone a happy February full of rest and not to be productive citizens in the world. Just some rest, some valued rest. See y'all next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.